And in case you do choose to ask your questions, um, you may appear in the recording. So if you do not want to appear in the recording, um, please put your questions uh, through the DM or um, in chat, and we'll be answering them, them anonymously. Um, I will first start off by introducing Project Edu Access. Um, I will then introduce uh, your panelists to you. Um, I will then provide you an outline, um, an overview and timeline. I will then go into the uh, eligibility uh, as well as the application processes. We'll then speak about the selection criteria, application documents, interview, and then the drop-in uh, session and interest form. Um, so Project Edu Access is, um, in, improves access to higher education, leadership, and professional opportunities, um, understanding that it is a privilege for most people from marginalized communities that are systemically denied um, through cost, information, and dispositional barriers. Project Edu Access is a modest attempt to improve inclusivity in these spaces by removing some of these barriers for marginalized community in the global south. We hope to achieve this by providing mentorship and engaging in advocacy. Um, today we have with us Dhruv Agarwal, who is a um, PhD in information science um, graduate um, and can candidate at Cornell University. He is a Quad Fellow 2023-2024. Dhruv, the floor is yours. Um, thanks. Uh, hi, everyone. It's uh, nice to be here and thank you for joining um, on a Saturday evening for most of you. Um, I will, as, as Salva said, I will go over some of the technicalities about the Quad Fellowship uh, first, and then we can, of course, um, do a Q&A if you have any questions for me. Um, so the Quad Fellowship is a new fellowship. It is, um, it is a multinational fellowship where uh, you will find the cohort includes member like fellows from um, at my time four countries, but now even more countries, which makes it even more exciting. And um, the aim of the fellowship is to foster um, STEM relationships amongst these countries. So it sponsors exceptional masters and doctoral students, um, current or incoming. So you you can already be in a masters or doctoral program or be applying to one, um, specifically in a STEM program and studying in the United States. Um, so if you if you fall into any of these, um, into all of these categories, uh, you would be eligible to apply for the Quad Fellowship. Um, now, what is this fellowship focusing on? Um, since it's an initiative of governments, it, it makes sense that it, it um, it really values the social and policy impact of STEM. So you may be the most amazing scientist or engineer in the world, but if you don't emphasize the social and policy impact that your work has made, uh, you wouldn't be doing, doing justice to your application. And I do believe that every STEM project does have a social and policy angle. You just need to find the right way to elicit that. Um, now, um, in terms of the benefits it provides, um, there is a monetary benefit, which is a one-time award, award of $40,000 for academic expenses. So you can use this, um, if you're a master's student, you can use this to pay your tuition. Um, if you're in a funded doctoral program, you can use this um, to as your stipend to attend conferences and so on. Um, but apart from that, it really provides a lot of networking opportunities and programming as well. And by programming, I mean, you will get, um, there'll be talks and there'll be, um, you will be connected to mentors in the field and so on, uh, which, which is super useful. Um, now the application for this year is open. This would be the second cohort. Um, it opened on... February 1st, and it's due in about 10 days from now, so not too far, on April 1st. And this is not an April Fool's joke. Um, so I hope you're all working on your applications. Um, and the in terms of the timeline, the recipients will be announced in July 2024. So how the time, timeline works is that you apply, just like your grad school applications, you apply now, you get um your fellowship in july 2024 and then um the programming and everything begins in august 2024 for the 
next academic year, which is 24, 25. Um, yeah, can we move to the next slide? Yeah, I just want to quickly go over the eligibility because it's, it's slightly complicated for um, this fellowship. So of course you must be more than 18 years of age to apply. Um, you must be a citizen or permanent resident of either um, the four court countries, Australia, India, Japan, or the United States, or any of the 10 Asian countries, um, which, which are all listed here. Um, and if you have dual citizen, citizenship, that works fine. Um, your, um, so another eligibility requirement is that you need to have had a bachelor's degree in a STEM field um, by the time you, by the time your cohort begins their tenure as as a court fellow. So by August 2024, you should have graduated with a master's degree. Um, and and this, all, this means that by 2024 or before. So for example, I applied two years after I graduated because I worked for two years before graduate before going to grad school. Um, so, so that's also fine. Um, and of course, you, you should have demonstrated um, great academic record at the undergraduate level or um, at the master's level. So in fact, I should I should say that you need to have had a bachelor's degree by August 2024, but you could also have had a master's degree by then. Uh, because if you are applying for a PhD degree, you could have had a master's degree by then. Uh, and in either case, you need to have um, a strong academic record. Um, so as I said before, you could either be a prospective graduate student or a current graduate student at a US university. Um, and by perspective, you don't need to have had an offer already. You should be applying or in the process of applying. Um, but of, of course, for you to be a court fellow, you should have an offer by August 2024. Um, and if you're a current student, you, you must be enrolled in your program by the, until the end of your tenure. So if you're planning to graduate in say like December 2024, um, that doesn't work. You need to graduate after the tenure. Um, and one caveat is that clinical healthcare programs such as MD, so like Doctor of Medicine or Master of Nursing or MBAs are not eligible um, uh, for, for this program. Um, yeah, now that all of the bookkeeping is uh, taken care of, let's talk about the application. So the application consists of three rounds, um, but let's focus on round one for now because that's where all of you will be. Um, the online application. And the online application in, um, in terms of the deliverables is somewhat similar to the grad school applications that you would have already filled by now or would be in the process of filling. Uh, but it includes a statement of purpose. It includes two short essays, I think 250 words each, um, and then all the boring background information about your address and your phone number and so on. Um, and uh, so this is all you need to fill. And then you need to uh, provide three letters of recommendations from, uh, from referees. At least two of these LORs must come from professors who can speak about your academic capabilities and uh, one may come from a professional or another academic uh, referee who can speak about your leadership, um, your any efforts you've put in to create social impact and so on. Uh, because remember that this fellowship is about social and policy impact of STEM, right? So after the online application, there is a long wait uh, while they review your applications. And then if you move on to the next step, it's an expert review or an expert interview, uh, which is designed to assess your academic proficiency in your field. So this is, I won't call it a technical interview, but it is an academic interview. So the good thing about interviews at this level is that um, they will never ask you things like, oh, give me like the formula or like an algorithm for, some, for something, right? Um, they will assess your academic proficiency by asking you about your work and who knows better about your work than you yourself, right? So it's great, it's a fun interview, but it is designed to assess your academic proficiency. 
Um, and then if you go through that round, the final round is a panel interview. And this is um, where they will assess your, uh, in your potential impact as Quad Fellow, how you would fit into the class of Quad Fellows for this year, um, your passion for creating impact through STEM, um, and um, and just general compassion and curiosity for the world. Um, so this is uh, often taken by someone who is an academic. Uh, so the panel will include one academic, so like a professor or someone, and someone who is who actually like works on real world problems. So someone from the business world, or in my case, it was a bureaucrat. Um, so that that creates for a very interesting interview. Um, now, again, just some logistics so that you know what all you need to apply. Uh, you need to submit your transcripts from your undergraduate university. Um, and I think if you have a master's degree also from your master's universities. Um, so you should have that. And if you need that, um, if you need to request for it early, you should do that now because some universities have a delay period between when they give you the transcript. Um, and if you are in a current program, it you need to have a transcript which shows your academic record until now because you may not have graduated, which is fine. Um, and then, as I said, the statement of purpose, which we will talk about in depth um, for uh, the rest of the session, but um, that and then two short essays, which we'll talk about uh, your academic goals, professional goals, and the the two short essays have prompts for them. So you know what to write about. And you also need to submit your resume, no more than two pages. And this is just like a resume, resume or a CV anywhere else where you will just objectively list, list down everything you've done, including your education, work experience, volunteer work, publications. Some people also list the courses they've taken if they're relevant to what they want to do in the future um and all of that um and then three letters of recommendation um now i know in india some um uh, so if you've worked or like interned in india or if uh, you're in a university in india professors or your managers or your mentors may have given you the letters of recommendation and asked you to submit them but that's really not the norm here so you will have to just enter the names of these referees and email IDs, and then Quad will reach out to them for them to upload a letter, a letter for you. Um, and um, try not to write your own letter. Right, get your referees to write the letters because um, I know this is sometimes um, requested by professors in India, where they'll be like, "Oh, just write a letter. I'll submit it." Uh, I think it becomes very apparent when you're reading the letter that you yourself have written it. So maybe you can give your professors or mentors points about the letter, uh, about what you what uh, all you've done, and then they can put it together into a letter. But um, that's just like a quick uh, tip you can use to um, get a better letter in. Um, as I said, two letters from professors, one from either a professor or professional contact. Um, and then we will also talk about uh, the letters of recommendation in depth for the rest of this session. Um, can you move to the next slide? Okay, great. Um, so just in terms of um, the fireside chat, uh, we will there be a series of questions that um, will come up and that we can sort of discuss. Um, and some of the first questions that's usually sort of commonly asked is, uh, can we reuse our grad school SOP for the fellowship? What's the difference between them? Yeah. Um, so no, you should not reuse your grad school SOP for your fellowship SOP and not just for this fellowship, for any scholarship or fellowship you're applying to. Um, and that's because the grad school SOP is intended to see whether you're fit, whether you're fit to attend a grad school program or whether you are you are a good fit for that particular program. Whereas the Cord Fellowship um, SOP or any other fellowship SOP is intended to gauge whether you are a fit for, so you may be an academic fit, but, but there is a lot of other things you need to, you need to align with to be a fellow, right? So for example, um, in 
let's talk about the Cord Fellowship more specifically. So here, as I've been saying, the essence is the social and policy impact of STEM, right? And this is not something you would talk about in a grad school SOP. In a grad school SOP, you will focus on your academic achievements, your um, publications, your internships, your work experience, and how all of that helped you decide that you want to do graduate studies. But um, in your court fellowship SOP, you, you will still mention a lot of that but you will weave in social and policy impact that you've achieved from your work, right? So you may have done um, a course project at some point, or you may have done some internship with um, a social impact organization, or you may have written a paper on social impact uh, related topics. So in your grad school SOP, you would have mentioned those for their own merit, but now you will mention those for their social merit. Uh, their policy merit. So, for example, in my case, my research is about uh, low income, um, about technology for low income and low resource communities. And uh, while I did have publications, while um, I did some research on these topics, uh, I used my graduate SOP, uh, graduate school SOP as a starting point, And then I weaved in a lot of social impact that I created from this work. So, um, for example, I talked about how, um, so when describing my projects, I would now also talk about interacting with these communities to create better technology for them and not just the fact that I created the technology. So all of these social interactions are really important for this SOP. And that's why you can't reuse your grad school SOP, but yes, you can, you can take heavy inspiration from it and edit it out, um, to, to say some of these things. Great. Um, who should applications take applicants take recommendation letters from? Yeah. Um. So, like, recommendation letters are extremely important for any application, and I have been on admissions committees, um, over the last couple of years, and I know how much of an impact letters have on uh on the, on the application committee. Now. You oftentimes, and when I was in undergrad, I would also often ask if I should ask for letters from famous people or people who have closely worked with. And often it's it's hard that everyone's worked with a famous person. Uh, just, the match just doesn't work out right. But um, you should absolutely, absolutely get a letter from people who you have closely worked with. If they happen to be famous, great. If not, that's not an issue because when uh, the committee is reading your letter, they are looking for depth. They are not looking for a one-liner from a famous person. So they want you, the letter writer to talk about the specifics of the work you've done, what project you've worked on with them, um, how long was the uh, how long was the project, or how long the letter writer has known them, um, and oftentimes just teaching them courses is not enough. So you need to have worked with them on like a course project or preferably a longer term research project. Uh, you may you should have interacted with them outside of class in like office hours or um, their lab meetings if you were part of the research projects um, and so on. And the letter writer should also be instructed to talk about the social and policy impact of the work you did with them. So yes, you worked on so-and-so projects. They were published at amazing venues. Um, they You also presented, presented them at like conferences and international venues and everything. That's great. But you need to talk about, like your letter writers need to talk about uh, you going above and beyond to create social impact from that work. Um, so yes, definitely instruct your letter writers to do that. And in terms of who to ask, ask people who you have worked with closely, don't worry about whether they're famous or not. Um, because the way they write the letter, uh, the passion comes through. So like if a letter writer is passionate about trying to help a student uh, reach better careers, um, that will come through in their writing. Um, and yeah, I mean, I can also answer questions about this later uh, in the in the audience Q and A. Um, great. So, what do you think led you to winning the fellowship? Um. Yeah. So, 
I mean, I've talked enough about the content of my application and I think um, I would say two things. One is I just got this. This was very aligned with the research I do. So my research is literally about creating social impact from computer science, right? So um, my research is about using technology to help underserved communities with their societal problems, with uh, with development and um, how you can use AI for all of that and how you can also build AI to uh, be culturally appropriate for people outside of uh, Western cultures. So all of that is to say that it was a great fit and it was just lucky that I came across the fellowship in its first year and my work fit right in. So yes, that was helpful, but I also want to say that I met so many other court fellows whose work, if I heard about their work in like another venue, I would be, I wouldn't be drawn to the social impact of their work because it's not obvious. But when we met at the Quad Summit, everyone had tremendous scope of social impact in their work. So you needn't have, you needn't have like done, you needn't have solved poverty or you needn't have like solved all the problems in the world with your work. You just need to have enough motivation to use your skills for social impact. And that needs to come through in your, in all your material. Um, and I was able to do that. It was slightly easy for me to do that because my work was around that topic already. But so many other court fellows were also able to do that, even though their work may be like super technical. But like, for example, if you're working in Elgo, so my field is computer science. So I can give examples around that. But if you're working in like building algorithms for technical solutions in computer science, you may initially think that you don't have any scope for social impact or you may not have created some already. But if you think deeper, if you reflect about your work, you can talk about the potential of uh, your algorithm or like any algorithm that you've developed to create social impact. So for example, that algo an algorithm I developed could be help could help in reducing air pollution in New Delhi um, or things like that. So you, you needn't have done that, but the motivation to do something like that should be there. Um, so that was one, just the social and policy side of my work was helpful. And the other thing that helped me was just a lot of preparation. I put in a lot of effort into this application, which I haven't done for, um, uh, which I haven't done for like past applications, um, maybe because they weren't as great a fit, but I really want to emphasize that if you spend long enough on your application material, it really reflects, um, and uh, it it becomes apparent that this candidate is a great fit for this fellowship. So um, I wrote my SOP about two months before the deadline. I sent it out for review to many people, friends, family, professors, um, and I got feedback from all of them. And just sending it out for review was not enough. I also sent them a short blurb about the Quad Fellowship so that they know what it is about and whether the things that it's looking for um, are coming through in my material. So I got all of those reviews. I incorporated that feedback. Then I got a second round of feedback from some new people uh, to see if my application material was um, was well-structured. It was um, communicating everything I wanted to and so on. Um, uh, and then once I got through to the interview stages, I prepared a lot for the interviews. I actually wrote a blog post about my preparation, which I can share later. But I I would sit down, I would scour through the Cord Fellowship website looking for um, things that they look for in a Cord Fellow. I noted it all down and then I reflected upon what experiences in my life I want to talk about to, to show, say, social impact, to show leadership, to show compassion, to show integrity and so on. Because when the fellowship focuses on all these things, they will come up at some point in the interview. And if I've thought about that in the past or like during my preparation phase, it would be easy to put things together and think on the feet. Um, and then during the interviews, I, the, during the interview round, I also did a lot of mock interviews, which I am a strong proponent of because like right now, I feel like I'm blabbering, but uh, 
if you do that in an interview, you lose valuable time that you could have spent to demonstrate other um, other qualities in you to the interview panel. So you want to be comprehensive in what you're saying, but you also don't want to blabber for like 10 minutes of on just one answer, right? Um, so I think the mock interviews were really helpful in uh, helping me articulate everything that I had prepared uh, previously and uh, seeing where I need to uh, stop talking, where I need to maybe rephrase what I'm saying to create more impact for the speaker, uh, for the interviewers. And finally, what I did was I also did a lot of research on my interview panel because they informed me who my interviewers were going to be. And this is just, I was utilizing the human bias in liking someone when they say, when they speak a common language. So if I was being interviewed, sorry, if I was being interviewed by a, a professor of political science, I looked, I, I, I don't work in political science, right? So I looked up their work. I know, so, okay, so they work in like statistics and political science and then like a, st a statistical political scientist. So then I knew that I could talk a little more technical with them um, and I could explain my work a little more technically. Whereas if they were if they were not so technical, I would focus on the social impacts of my work and the qualitative aspects of my work rather than the quantitative one. So overall, that is to say that read about who your interviewers are and so on. Um, I know you're not at the interview stage yet, but we're having the session right now and hopefully all of this will help you uh, throughout the process. Um, great, thank you so much for that. Um, so if we could just go a little deeper into the selection criteria um, and then we can probably take questions towards the end of the session. Um, so okay. I want to probably go into the selection criteria a little more deeper. Yes, yeah. So um, I have spoken about all of these things at different points in the fireside chat, but um, I think these are important to call out explicitly, uh, especially when you're close to submitting your application. So the first one is obvious. You need to be academically uh, sound to, to win the fellowship. Now, one thing that I need to point out is that if you have a few bad grades, that, that's perfectly fine, but explain it, right? Explain in your application why you have a series of bad grades or just even one bad grade. Um, and that explanation is all you need for the committee to overlook it. Um, and I've seen this not just, I've seen this in like multiple committees that I've been part of where we are just looking for an explanation. We are not looking for like A's throughout your undergrad, right? Um, and that explanation could be personal. So you may have fallen sick. You may have been going through family trouble. You may not be doing great with your mental health. And all of that is perfectly valid. Or it may be more logistical where maybe you were interning along with your coursework that semester. Maybe you were working on a startup. Maybe you were working with an NGO, which took time away from academics. So whatever the reason is, be honest about it and write it because that gives you two things. One, it explains why you had a bad grade. And then second, it also communicates honesty and transparency to the application committee. Um, the fact that you are willing to say that out loud, no matter how you may be perceived, that's really beneficial in, in such an application. Um, so academic ex excellence is, uh, of course, um, what I went through. If if you're already a doctoral candidate, which I don't think is, is the audience in this call, but then you should obviously talk about your research experience in your SOPs as well, because then think about what you're telling the court fellow committee, right? You're saying, hey, I do this research. I'm a, I need money to do this research. Can you give me some money? And then to convince them, you need to tell them that, oh, I've actually done this research. So you need to talk about it if you're a doctoral student. Um, and then I think I've spoken about this extensively, uh, the, the social and policy impact of STEM. Um, and um, yeah, so yeah, I mean, I can go through all of this, but uh, broadly you need to either have demonstrated impact in the past, or you may want to do so in the future. Both are perfectly fine. Um, 
let me just quickly see if I'm missing any point that's listed here. Yeah, another way to demonstrate in impact um, or just an appreciation for the social impact of STEM is by talking about any interdisciplinary work you may have done. So for example, um, I do work at the intersection of computer science and development studies. Um, so if you've done something like that, or if you've done like, if you've used your programming skills to in like economics, um, to help with socioeconomic outcomes, um, all of that is good to talk about in this, in this fellowship SOP, because all of those will evoke a sense of social impact. Um, I think I've spoken a lot about social impact, but I've been saying social and policy impact. Let me quickly talk about policy impact as well. Um, the thing about policy impact is that it's very hard to make policy changes or to, uh, to do anything around policy changes as an undergrad student. And we all know that. And the admissions committee knows that, like the application committee knows that. Um, so we are not looking for you to have created a policy that is now impacting all of your country. Uh, what we are looking for is an appreciation for the fact that your research can be used to change policy. Um, and if you've had, so for example, I had an experience where I, a research project I did was could have impacted policy, air pollution policy in New Delhi. And I had a hard time actually communicating that to policymakers because as a computer science student, I wasn't trained in talking to policymakers. So that became my pitch. Now I my pitch was I do all this work where I think there is scope for policy impact, but I don't know what to do next. Um, so by being part of this fellowship, I will get training to talk to policymakers. I will also get a network within the policymakers uh, space so that I know who to talk to. Um, so I gave this example to show that I did not create any policy impact as an undergrad. Um, but yet I had an appreciation for that side of STEM, uh, which, which helped my application. Uh, we can move to the next slide. Yeah. And then these two points are, uh, these will be, you will get an opportunity to uh, showcase them as part of the two essays. So I've mostly talked about the SOPs for SOP for now, because that is uh, by far the most important, maybe up there with your uh, letters of recommendation. But these two short essays will help you demonstrate some of the quote unquote qualitative side of you. Um, so um, one of the, uh, I mean, so those essay prompts are designed to help the committee gauge your sense of initiative and innovation and creativity, which are the selection criteria listed here. Um, so this is where you can talk about your extracurriculars, your um, any social work you have done uh, and, and all of that. And let me preface that by saying that your SOP is not a good place to talk about your extracurriculars. Um, talk about mostly your academics there, mostly your academics, internships, work experience, research projects, things like that. Uh, quote unquote, more professional things. And here you can talk about your extracurricular opportunities and how they help you um, create impact. So for example, I, um, so for sense of initiative, I talked about a program I used to run in my undergrad um, to, to help young kids from a nearby village learn computers. And um, I talked about not just the program, but also the thought that went into creating such a program. So why was that important? What are the benefits and what are the risks of such a program? So for example, one risk of this is that maybe I'm enforcing a techno de deterministic view of the world on them. So maybe by running this program, I'm communicating to them that if you don't know how to operate a computer, you won't be able to do anything in your life. So you want to show that you think about all these things, right? Uh, you want to communicate that. So talk about some of these challenges that you faced in, in any extracurricular activities that you were part of and overall show a picture of initiative that you took. Um, and then um, the, the last selection criteria is innovation and creativity. Uh, here you can talk about, so 
I don't think the prompt explicitly asked for innovation and creativity this year. Uh, it didn't last year as well, but the prompts are different from last year. Um, so I think innovation and creativity will come through through your SOP itself and not your essays. Your essays will mostly talk about like the personal side of you. The essays are meant to contextualize your academic background to the person that you are, right? So um, if you have applied for grad school already, some grad school asks for a personal statement and a statement of purpose. So this is similar to that, where the essays do the job of a personal statement. They contextualize what you want, who you are as a person. And then the SOP is then as an application reader, I, I now have a sense of who you are. And then I look at your academic uh, achievements. Um, but yeah, all of this will come through overall through all the three essays combined. Okay. Um, and yeah, this is just bookkeeping. You also need to submit TOEFL scores, which presumably many of you will already have because you would be applying to grad school. Uh, and most universities need TOEFL scores anyway. Um, a question I get often is, is there a cutoff? There is no cutoff. You just need to be quote unquote, fairly good at English. Uh, and this is only because the court fellowship funds students who study in the United States um, and the language of instruction in US universities is English. Um, so, um, and, and all the court fellowship programming and your interviews and everything will also be in English. So yes, you need to submit your TOEFL scores. Um, if you are at a point where you don't have your TOEFL scores, you can reach out to the, uh, or if your TOEFL scores have expired, for example, you can reach out to the um, applications team to ask if you can still submit them. But um, yeah, I, I mean, if, if you're in that boat, we can talk about that separately. Yeah, and um, just bringing everything together before we go into the um, audience Q&A. Um, the interview, as I said, is in two rounds. The first is an academic interview. It is not an oral exam. They will not ask you for formulas or algorithms. They will talk about your research projects or your um, internship experiences or your course projects. Um, and but but the flavor of the interview will still be academic. So for example, they asked me, what are you most, since I was a doctoral student, they asked me about research, but they asked me, what, what is it that excites you most about your field? And that's a very interesting question because now I need to show the fact that I know what's going on in my field. I need to have read recent papers. I need to know where it's going and I need to know what excites me about it. So it is not a technical question, but it is an academic question. Uh, so those are the kinds of questions you can expect in the first interview. And then the second interview is more at the intersection of STEM and social impact, where they will talk about your alignment with the fellowship um, in terms of your values. Um, and the interviews, as I said, maybe from academia, but also from government, entrepreneurs, uh, from nonprofits. And this is, I guess you may have given like quote unquote HR interviews for your internships or your jobs. And this is similar to that, but obviously like it has an academic flavor to it because you're applying for an academic program, but still it focuses on the social and policy impact. So for example, one question that a court fellow was asked was, um, tell us about a time where someone showed you compassion and how did that make you feel? Uh, which is a nice question to think about. It's hard to think about it immediately, but those are the kinds of questions you were asked. Um, all interviews are conducted over Zoom. The entire process is virtual and um, you can always email the applications team for any questions that you have. Yeah, and just a quick plug um, that the official court fellowships team is also doing um, a session like this, but more official than this. Um, so the dates for that are listed here. Um, feel free to join that if you would like. Um, and all of this information, 
Um, I don't know if this slide deck will be shared with you, but if not, all of this is information is uh, readily available on the Quad Fellowship website. So the, of, of course, all the information about everything we spoke about, uh, eligibility documents, what they look for in a Quad Fellow, but also information about the drop-in sessions is on the website. Um, yeah, um, I think I've covered a lot of this um off and on during this session but let me just quickly go through the slide because i think these are good takeaways from this i've covered a lot it may be a lot for you to uh process but for the essays and the statements be specific uh avoid generic statements and instead focus on your work achievements and goals so for example when you're trying to answer the question, why is the court fellowship important for you? So like, why should you be given the court fellowship? Everyone's going to see, say that, oh, it will give me networking opportunities. It will give me um, resources for professional development and so on. But you can say that, I can say that, a uh, high school student can say that, a uh, 30 year old, some person already in industry can say that, right? So this is very generic. Say how, exactly it will help you in your research. So for example, my research at that point was about air pollution. And I said that my research is currently limited to India because that's what I know about. But because COD is a multinational fellowship, it will grant me access to researchers um, and PhD students from four other countries, three other countries. And that will help me take my research beyond India, help me generalize my research, right? Now that is very specific to my work. How is the court fellowship helping me as an applicant? So think about these things and write specifics in your, uh, in your material. Uh, and as I said, provide concrete examples. Um, and a mistake I see very commonly in both grad school SOPs as well as fellowship applications is uh, long emotional stories about your childhood. So you don't need to start your SOP since with since I was a child, I was super interested in engineering. Um, that's that's something great for your personal statement for your essays, but not for your SOP. Think about SOP as a misnomer. SOP actually should be called a research statement or like a professional statement if you're a master student because you need to write about your professional journey uh, and if your professional journey was significantly affected by your circumstances write about that but not every SOP needs to start with um, an emotional story about your childhood uh, seek iterative feedback I can't emphasize this enough your friends and family will give you very useful feedback um, and this uh, the next point is uh, we covered this initially when I was asked whether we can use the grad school SOP for the court fellowship. I said no because you need to tailor your application in line with the criteria for this particular fellowship, and the criteria for this fellowship is different from the criteria for a grad school. So yes, you can use it as a starting point, but then tailor your application. Um, explain some projects in detail. Uh, ensure that. Your, whatever you're writing is comprehensible for a general audience. So, um, for example, if you're in mathematics and you have done like really technical work, try to write it in a way that is understandable to say someone like me who has like a, yes, a technical background, but not like a math background. Um, and explain what you've done in your projects, not just uh, so explain how you went about your projects, not just what you've done. So show, not tell. Uh, that's really important for any application. So uh, I would say that, okay, I worked on these research projects about air pollution, but then I would also say I collected data. I went around installing sensors. I then cleaned all that data using so-and-so tools. And then I analyzed this data. I used so-and-so model and so on, right? So it's important to show that you have academic rigor by talking about what you did in the project and um, think deeply about the social element of your work um, and capacity for leadership, which I think we've talked um, enough in this call about. Great, thank you so much. Um, we will now take questions. Um, we have a few questions that we 
So I should take. Um, so I think the first question that's come up uh, is, I have an acceptance offer at Harvard Kennedy School's Masters in Public Policy program, which is not STEM, but has a STEM designated pathway through selective courses. Um, so will this course still apply to the Quad Fellowship eligibility? Um, so I want to preface this by saying that I am not the right person to answer any eligibility related questions uh, because I'm not representing the official court fellowship team here. Um, I can help with application related questions. And here I would say that probably not, but you should email them to ask um, because from what I know, they need a program to be an MS for it to be a STEM program, which is, I, I agree that not all STEM programs are MS, but that's something you should ask about them. Uh, ask them about their eligibility. I can write, I, I will just send the email that you can reach out to. Yeah, uh, court fellowship at IIE.org. Um, but yeah, I mean, definitely spend time figuring this out before you spend a lot of time and energy on your application. Great. Um, the next, so the next question is, I haven't applied to any university till now. Is it too late to apply? Um, I think this question is more about grad school than about the court fellowship. I think there are still some universities that have um applications open for their master's programs i think it's it may be too late for phd programs if you're thinking about that but um for master's programs um i think there are still some programs open and i don't know which ones but you will need to do your own research about whether any universities are still accepting applications for um stem related master's programs Okay, great. Um, my undergrad was not in a STEM related subject, but the master's I'm going for is STEM designated. Would this be an issue for the fellowship application? Uh, unfortunately, yes, because uh, you may have noticed that in the eligibility criteria, one of them was that you need to have a master's, uh, sorry, a bachelor's in a STEM field uh, when you apply. <clears throat> so if your undergrad was not in STEM, um, that might be a problem for you um but just so that i'm understanding the question correctly you are going for a master's which is stem designated but you don't already have a master's which is stem designated right um in that case it will be a problem because um if you had a bachelor's degree that was not stem but a master's degree that was stem and then you were going for another master's degree um then you could create you could make a case that you have stem education before your application um but right now that's hard to make so yeah i'm afraid that might be an issue okay uh so the next question is i have a bachelor's in engineering i also have a master's in public policy from azim premji university in india i'm currently accepted to the mpp from Ford School, University of Michigan. I'm enrolling because they have a specific cre uh, credential pathway that works with technology policy. Will I be eligible to apply for Quad Fellowship? So her undergrad is in engineering, but she has a master's in public policy and she's applying um, for, um, she's been accepted to the MPP from uh, University of Michigan. Yeah, I mean, this is similar to the first question where um, I, think an MPP may not be eligible for the court fellowship, but again, this is something you should email court fellowships team and ask or attend the session that they're hosting soon, um, uh, where you can ask this question because, um, yeah, I'm not sure exactly what they count as a STEM program and whatnot. Okay. Um, so the next question is the course I received acceptance has a STEM eligible classification of instructional program codes. Is this the classification of the trademark of STEM based courses? Um, again, I am not sure about this. From what I know, they are looking for MS programs. So if it's an MS, uh, great. I think it might work. If not, you should email them to ask. 
uh, what's meant by a good academic record? Are we supposed to have a minimum CGPA or be in the top 10%? Oh yeah, I think this is a great question. Um, and I briefly talked about this during the chat, but let me just quickly summarize all of that again. So no, there is no minimum CGPA. Um, and you do not need to be in the top 10. You need to have consistently good grades and a few bad grades in the middle are okay. And by good grades, I don't mean all A's, right? You, you need to have... I mean, well, the, the grading system is different for different places, but uh, you need to have like the amongst the top few grades in every course uh, for all of your courses. And if not, explain those. Um, last year, the court fellowship and most graduate school uh, web application websites often have this small text box saying, is there anything more you want to talk to the graduate, to the admissions committee about? And this is where you mentioned that, right? This is where you say, oh, I have one D plus in my transcript, or I have like three D pluses in my transcript, and I want to explain why that happened, and it was for so and so reason. So explain all of those, and um, the rest of your academic record should be fairly decent, but you don't need to have like a full CGPA, of course. Okay. And sorry, just I want to say that this is something that was told to me when I was an applicant for grad school and I never believed people who would tell me this um, and now I'm telling you that and you'll probably not believe me but trust me that if you um, I've been on committees and I know that if you explain of, of your grades that really does the job. Great um, is the scholarship biased towards people who are already enrolled in a university I saw a list of scholars in 2022 more than 50% of scholars were already studying in the US. Um, I'm, are you sure you were looking at the Cord Fellowship scholars? Because I think the first class of Cord Fellowship was 23, 24. There, there wasn't a Cord Fellowship cohort in 2022. Um, I don't know who, who asked this question. I can't see the name here, but um, but yeah, I mean, irrespective of what list you saw, I can answer this question. Um, it is not biased towards people who already have an admit. Uh, but if you do have an admit, definitely mention that in your SOP because it might help. Um, now, if you're looking at any court fellowship list now, everyone will be in a grad school in the US, of course, because um, to finally be a fellow, you need to have an acceptance and attending a grad school in the US. Um, yeah, but I don't have the numbers, but I don't think there is any bias towards people who are already enrolled in the university. Okay, uh, the question with respect to sharing the recording, yes, we will be sharing the recording. I will put the link to the YouTube channel at the end of the session, so you can definitely refer to that. Uh, are the interviewers from India or abroad? Or oh, they are from across the world. Um, when I was applying, they were from the four quad countries, um, India, US, Japan, and Australia. Now they may also be from any of the 10 Asian countries. So yes, um, that also is a, is a nice cue to talk about the fact that when you're writing your material, assume an international audience. So some people may not have context about what you're saying because they because your application readers may not be from India. So yes, whenever you're writing something that is specific to India, think about what, what you're writing and whether that's very specific to India. And if it is, provide context around that. Great. Um, Ayush uh, had a question. Um, if you, Ayush, if you want to ask your question. Yeah, um, yes. uh, am I audible? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Firstly, uh, I want to express my heartfelt thanks to you, Dhruv, uh, for this session and also your blog. Because uh, I, I read about the Quad Fellowship a few weeks ago and I was feeling so lost about this. Because uh, I think you answered my question recently, yeah, just a minute ago, that when I went through the profiles of the Quad Fellows from last year, I was just seeing people who had uh, uh, IIT toppers or IIT medalists and uh, people mm -hmm. from huge colleges or who are into huge colleges, PhD programs. Uh, and I was feeling a bit daunted by that. 
but I think uh, just a minute ago you explained that uh, the grades and uh, the academic undergraduate record uh, isn't held that a position. Because just that I was concerned of the fact that uh, a social and policy impact from a work can be a very subjective matter, whereas mm -hmm. grades are very objective. So maybe is, is it there something that uh, you can quickly reject applicants or quickly accept applicants based on the grade and because the social impact is so subjective? Um, so I, uh, that, that's a good question. Thank you for the question. Um, I think, so I can't speak to what the court fellowship, uh, application committee does because I'm not in that committee. Um, but I can speak from my experience of being on other application committees. So for example, graduate school application committees in my university, where we never reject applications based on grades. Uh, we look at the first thing we look at is the material. So like your SOP, your essays, your letters of recommendation. We do glance through the transcript, maybe like literally in like five seconds, just one scroll through the transcript. We look for um, any grades that may be super low. And then we, we look for explanations on, on those grades. And even if they are not explained, it's not a case to to reject an application. So I do think grades play much lesser of a role than it seems from the outside. But if you have like all D pluses or like all Ds and you haven't explained that, that will definitely be an, a concern, right? So yeah, I'm not, I don't, I'm not trying to portray an ideal world here where grades don't matter. They do. But yes. let me say it this way. They won't be a green flag, but they can be a red flag. So if you have like really bad grades, they will be a red flag, but really good, good grades won't get you in or a few bad grades won't get you out. All right. Yeah. Thank, thank you so much for the perspective. I really feel encouraged. Thank you. Yeah. And um, sorry, this is, I think a good time to also talk about um, who you will be competing against as applicants. And this is like, not exactly what you asked, but I think relevant here, which is, um, you are not competing against everyone else who, who's applying. You are competing against, so you're competing against applicants from your country in your field, planning to do the same thing, which really uh, creates this pool smaller, right? So don't, because the court fellowship is looking for diversity in people from different countries and people in, from different backgrounds, uh, wanting to study different things in their program. So, if you are applying in a field which is which is not like everyone not everyone else is is studying the same thing then you actually have a sort of an advantage because now you have a smaller pool you're competing with so keep that in mind because you're not competing with everyone else who's applying you're competing with everyone else from your country in your area who's applying thank you so much for the perspective Great. Um, Mohamed, Sabir, do you want to ask your question? Yeah. Hi, Dhruv. Uh, thanks for the session. Uh, actually, I asked that question regarding that uh, bias towards this. I had applied for this part fellowship in 2022 for the 23 cohort. Unfortunately, I was not uh, selected because I had just, uh, I didn't know that much about it and I didn't uh, get my ISS reviewed from proper people. Mm -hmm. I had uh, another question. This, uh, uh, my grades were like decent in my undergrad and after that it's been five years I am working in uh, ISRO uh, as an engineer so I have a, this uh, professional experience so does it add to my uh, application I have a good experience of uh, uh, I've worked in multiple projects so even though my grades are not very high these are decent and I have a good experience does it add to my application oh yeah definitely I think um, working experience is useful so I think every application is different. So it's not, it's not that one is better than the other, but I think you will still be able to field a very competitive application um, through your experience of working for five years. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Um, does anyone have other questions um, that we can answer? We've completed all the questions in the chat. Um, so if there aren't any questions, okay. So just to end the session, Hi. yeah. Sorry, yeah. I have a quick question if that's yeah, okay. Sure. 
so there is a question in the section about in the graduate application is it asks if you are doing an additional graduate degree why but if it is our first graduate degree also that's a compulsory question so do you have any idea about like what to write in that or something it's an um, academic application section i see i mean i haven't seen the application portal for this year but um if not you can just write an a or like not answer that question by uh, i mean yeah you okay. can't leave it blank because it's required but just write an a or something right yeah. uh yeah one last question so you also mentioned about social impact right creating social impact with your uh, um work but how do we like express that in an essay maybe i'm trying to pick your brain when you want to do something so i'm starting a phd program I'm one year in the program and uh, this is what i want to do but i haven't done yet mm -hmm. so will that be like kind of because generally in SOP, it all, always has to be I statements, right? So, mm -hmm. but if there is something that we want to do in the future, will that count? Um, or is that like speculation or something? No, I think that definitely counts because um, as I said, they're looking for an appreciation for STEM, for social impact through STEM. Um, and if you talk about this, at least you're conveying that you are motivated to do that. Uh, of course, try to make it as specific as you can. So um, talk about the work you've done and how that can potentially create impact. So that's not speculation. That's wishful thinking, I think, um, mm -hmm. which, which serves the purpose of the application. Thank you, Dhruv. Great. Um, are there any other questions that uh, you'd like to ask or that we haven't answered? Any follow-up questions as well? We can... This is probably the best time to do that. Um, I don't think I see any other questions. Well, um, I have linked the YouTube channel for Project Edu Access where we will be posting this recording as well as the recording of our previous sessions. If you have any other questions, you can reach out to us on info at projecteduaccess.com and we will do our best to answer uh, your questions. Uh, I think we've end we've uh, come to the end of this session so thank you so very much through for your time and for your insights it's truly been a pleasure hosting you um if you could maybe drop in your email if you're comfortable with that so that everyone uh who has potential follow-ups can reach out to you uh but thank you so much again uh great so Dhruv has put his email id uh, on the group uh, chat and um, thank you so very much for organizing this and thank you everyone um, the recording for this should be up soon so in case you've missed anything you can always go back to the recording thank you everyone have a great day thanks uh, for organizing and um, actually can we stop the recording and then I will stick around for two minutes in case anyone has questions that they didn't feel comfortable asking while the recording was on uh, sure I think but to stop the recording i might have to end the session um just so it's, oh, okay. yeah okay, so cool. maybe we could if you ask... email me if you have any questions okay. that you weren't able to ask during the session and i'll be happy to answer great um thank you everyone and have a great day bye bye